chapter 1, 4 through 11, Mark's very succinct and pithy description of Jesus' baptism and the circumstances around them. Mark uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And a go team. I knew that you would both be able to get it. That's great. John the Baptizer appeared. Mark doesn't tell us anything about John up to this point. He doesn't tell us about Elizabeth. We don't know anything about it. What we do know is from the point of view of the people of Israel, John appeared in the wilderness, out of nowhere, showed up, hadn't heard a prophet for 400 years, and the prophet comes proclaiming a baptism for repentance for the forgiveness of sins in preparation for judgment, the coming day of the Lord, the appearance of the Messiah. He proclaims a baptism. Nobody had ever proclaimed a baptism for the people of Israel before, ever. There was a baptism for proselytes. In other words, if you were a dirty, sinning Gentile dog, and you wanted to become a Jew, you sure better get clean before you even started. And so there was, you had to take a bath in baptism, a ritual baptism, which uh, was only for proselytes. But this was something completely different and unique in the history of Israel. The prophet tells them, Thus saith the Lord, come to the Jordan, come to the river to the other side that you had to cross to become Israelites in the first place. Start completely new. Become like a proselyte. Become like a sinner. Be, recognize your sinfulness and be baptized as a way of pleading for the forgiveness of sins and putting yourself at the mercy of the divine court. Confessing up front because you don't want to be condemned. You want to confess and put yourself before God that God may present you. Plead for grace. Now, I submit that John did not promise them forgiveness. I don't hear an assurance of pardon anywhere in this. What I hear is, come repent and plead for the forgiveness of your sins. And so they came, and they pleaded, and they confessed. They came to the river confessing their sins. 
So you have to envision scenes where there is a crowded line coming up to John baptizing. And each person, when they come to John, first thing they have to do is they verbally and publicly in front of everyone openly admit their sins. Okay, folks, let's do it. No, I'm just teasing. Got shot there, right? But that's what they were doing. They were openly confessing their sins. So I see tears and shame. And as, as one person in the line hears the other person confessing their sins, they're reminded. And they're deeply moved. And this is quite a scene of conviction. As people openly confess their sins before God and man, and then get dunked on them under the water as a plea for forgiveness. And they don't know how God is going to answer this prayer. But they do know that they have the prayer unless they do this. Unless they confess their sins, they are not ever going to be ready for the kingdom that is coming, says the prophet. Thus saith the Lord. And why do they repent? Because one is coming who is so great, greater than me, that I'm not worthy even to untie his sandal. And though you see me baptizing with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And as Matthew and the other Gospels put it, with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I believe it's the fire of judgment that he's talking about. And so therefore you better repent. And they coming. There's this streaming from Judea and Jerusalem down to the prophet. How then does God answer their plea and their prayer for forgiveness? Well, he answers it quite almost in secret, very softly. In those days, Jesus, whom they don't know as anybody, they don't know we're talking about the Son of God. Jesus, the son of a carpenter, who nobody in Judea or Jerusalem knows because he comes all the way from Nazareth and Galilee. This stranger from the north comes and joins in the line that nobody notices. He's just one of them. And he joins in the line with the, with the sinners, and he comes, and he is baptized along with them. I submit that the way that God answers their prayer and their plea for forgiveness is that God himself, the judge, gets off the podium. What's that chair behind that the judge stands on? Rise, they all rise. He's way up there. He gets down and he gets behind with the, with, uh, with the sinners, uh, everybody attending, and he joins them. This is God's answer to their prayer for forgiveness. The Holy God, who is the Son of God, though He was without sin, God made Him to be sin, who knew, knew, knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God, in Romans. Jesus stands with us as one of us, becomes, is really, the repentant of all those people that stood in line and repented. He's the only one who didn't have anything to repent for. And is the only one who could repent for us adequately. And the only one who, having repented, then lived a holy life for us. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He comes in answer to their prayers as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Who personally bore our sins in His body that we might be dead to sin. And a life to all that is good, who bore our sins in his body on the cross, whose life from his baptism, his life, his death, his resurrection, everything for us on our behalf. That's what the Messiah does. Before he comes in judgment, he comes in answer to the forgiveness of sins, and he prepares us for. And just as he was coming up out of the water, parentheses, I guess the Baptist, right? He came up out of the water, he was dunked. And I have some uh, jokes about that I will not tell. Sorry, Lord, I'm repenting. 
Uh, but he came, up, came, Jesus came up out of the water, and as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens tore apart. The barrier between man and God ripped open. And as the representative person he saw before any of us saw, that there is direct access to God the Father. And the Spirit from God descending like a dove on him, in anticipation of our own baptism with the Holy Spirit, all flesh, the Spirit will, so, will fall on all flesh on Pentecost, but the Spirit descends on him first of all as our representative human, as the Son of Man, as well as the Son of God, the Spirit of God descends on him, giving the blessing of God and the power of God to his life. And a voice, he hears, hears a voice came from heaven. And he hears it and says, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. So he has the blessing of God the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit upon him as the Son on our behalf. Well pleased, why? Because he is presenting himself on our behalf in baptism. And God likes that, loves that, blesses that, blesses him. The words are very interesting. You are my son, the beloved, is a quote from Psalm 2. Uh, and I think it's verse 7. You are my son, my beloved son. Which is uh, a hymn of coronation of the king of Israel. And so he comes as the king. But the words, I am well pleased, comes from Isaiah 42.1. It's also a quote. And that is the first servant psalm. The suffering servant who in Isaiah 53 bears our iniquities and bears our sins in, in, in himself and suffers on our behalf and for our forgiveness. This is the awesome truth that Jesus' baptism is for us. The words in Christ are some of the most repeated words in the New Testament. When we are in Christ, our baptism is a share in His baptism. Our baptism has no meaning apart from His baptism. If, if it is not simply something we do for God. It's not a mere ordinance with no sense to it that we do in order to please God. It's not just a little ritual of belonging to the society. It is a participation in the repentance of Jesus Christ on our behalf. Our repentance is, means nothing apart from His on our behalf. It's in Him, in Him, that the blessing of God, the baptism of God, of the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness, the uh, adoption as children of God happens in Him. It's a sharing in the baptism of Jesus. Our baptism in Christ shares a share in Christ's obedience that then accrues to us so that we should hear the words and think of this in our baptism. The words to Jesus also apply to us because they are for Him. God says in our baptism, we see the heavens ripped open, the barrier between us and God completely gone because of Christ. And we should hear the voice from heaven of the Father saying, you, you, you are my beloved child. My child whom I love and I delight in you. How is this possible? Only in Christ. Because Christ repented for us, went through baptism for us, initiated, shared his ministry for us in that way. Everything that Jesus did, baptism, life, death, resurrection, completely and all for us, that we might share in his life. We are his. So that our baptism is to share in him. This is how, this is just one way that Paul describes the significance of our baptism in Christ. And I think it is uh, to the heart of the matter. 
and I will read it. It's from Romans chapter 6. Do you know, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Just pause a moment. Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. Now, just think about this. When Jesus died and was buried, that also was for us. And when he did that, as we are baptized into Christ, we are baptized into his death. This is from God's point of view. You know, it's easy to look at things from our point of view, but it could be that God's point of view on us is to be taken into account. Maybe that's the point of view that we need to adopt. From God's point of view, point of view, we have died in Christ. Done deal. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in death like His, we will certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But this is rhetorical, if we have died with Christ. He's saying, since we have died with Christ, we believe, that is, we know, that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. The death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves, recognize, accept the fact that you are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, believe it. 